Okay, well, we will, uh, we will get going on here. Uh, good afternoon and happy new year. Good to be, good to be back in the saddle again. We're going to have our um, friends in the state house, in the people's house tomorrow. Looking forward to that so that we can start to go over all of our legislative and our administrative priorities for 2022. We've got a lot of momentum. We want to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep that momentum going forward. This is our annual agenda rollout um, or our blueprints to build one Indiana. Uh, now our sixth, and it should be of no one's surprise, if you're a Hoosier, uh, that they're focused on five different pillars, um, which are our priorities. Those being economic development, workforce development, uh, our health and wellness development, our public health, um, obviously our community development, which we'll get into in depth here in a little bit, and then providing good government uh, services for every citizen of Indiana and all of our all of our guests. So we'll take them one by one on those five fronts and then we'd both be able to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Keep in mind that while we are um, on the eve of a short session, uh, our priorities and our agenda is not short. It is long and it is substantial when you consider all the administrative uh, priorities that we have either underway uh, or will soon be launching over the course of this next year. So we'll start with the first one. We'll burn right through these. We've got a number of people. I see Dr. Box. I see Dr. Jenner. I see Dr. Rosiniak. I'll call you Dr. Crouch here in a second if I don't, <laughs> if I'm not careful. Um, but uh, we've got a number of people who can also go uh, in depth into these different agency priorities uh, as we work through them. First, uh, on the economic front, economic development, obviously we we're coming off a very strong year in 2021 in terms of our uh, state's economy. Uh, just over at the IEDC, we ushered in a new all-time record in terms of our capital investment, in terms of new payroll, in terms of the number of new job commitments. Those brought in wages average wages of over $28 an hour. That's the second all-time high. Um, we also saw new headquarters either starting up here in the state of Indiana or relocating to the state of Indiana. We increased our FDI and our GDP, our FDI being our foreign direct investment and our GDP. That in turn uh, is uh, the reason why we saw such high revenue streams and uh, reserves. That's going to obviously enable us and trigger our ATR, our automatic taxpayer refund, uh, that will go into effect later this, later this spring by, by May 1, which will be, we'll be sending back $545 million um, uh, dollars back to 4.3 million Hoosiers. That's a little over 900,000, 910,000 Hoosiers that will be in receipt of a taxpayer refund. So that's catching all those people this time, unlike the last time this was this kick was kicked in, it's catching all those people who have an income tax liability, folks who filed um, and but don't have an income tax liability. We're gonna also be looking at other ways to keep this momentum going up on the economic front in a number of ways. Um, we'll be working with Travis Holden to make sure we get that ATR across the finish line, but then we're also working with um, Doc Brown, Representative um, Tim Brown, to make sure um, that we remain the number one manufacturing state in America per capita. We're number one, and as we continue to advance on the manufacturing front, we have to make sure that we're keeping up and keeping pace with all of the new equipment that's being purchased. And so we're proposing eliminating the 30% business personal property tax floor uh, on new equipment to encourage those continued uh, investments in the state of Indiana and to continue to build out that very important sector to our state's economy. When Secretary Chambers signed on board, it's been about a half a year now, uh, I first asked him to look under the hood and make sure that our toolkit, that our economic development toolkit, toolbox was keeping up as well. and. Um, 
and, and modernized, and, and he did exactly that. Obviously, the toolkit that we've been using has been in place for about 20 years. It served us well. I just talked about the records that we were breaking, uh, but in the ever-changing landscape out there and the deals that we're um, competing on, um, we need to make sure that we're nimble and that we're changing along with the times. And so we'll be seeking uh, advancement on a, a few, in a few areas. One, greater flexibility that's already uh, with the tools that we already have. And I'm, I'm referencing primarily our tax credits, different tax credits. Um, we want to look at those collectively, not just individually when we're going out and trying to recruit a business. Uh, to set up shop here and grow here in the state of Indiana. We also are going to be looking at um, creating a funding mechanism uh, to capture uh, the long-term benefit that we see with big projects that are looking for new homes and pull that up front uh, in the near term. So we'll still have those um, uh, you know, performance metrics in place but we're looking at what is the true ROI to the state of Indiana over the long term and how can we pull up some of those incentives or those investments um, as a, from the state perspective up front when we're doing the deal. And then lastly, and we'll be working with Senator Mishler on both of those and Senator Mishler on um, stepping up a remote worker program. We, if we've learned anything, we've talked about this a lot, um, folks can work anywhere. Uh, if we've learned anything through this pandemic. And um, we want to make sure that we're not losing any potential talent around the world if, if they want to um, log in anywhere, but they want to live here. Uh, we want to make sure that we're competing on that field. And so we'll set up a program um, that, will, that will have an end date of fiscal year 23, the end of fiscal year 23, but we, we don't know what we don't know right now. And so we're going to cast a, a wide net out there and be a, a very attractive place for remote workers to come call Indiana home. Second front or second pillar has everything to do with, we always, I always talk about people, 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 and how we're scaling up our number one asset. This is a lifelong um, pathway. This is pre-K to graduating from high school on to adult learning and adult training, skilling up for those jobs that are out there right now. We need to fill them. And so Dr. Jenner is here. We'll be looking at ways of strengthening up um, our, our kindergarten readiness. And uh, we'll be working with Representative Bob Baining on that front as well, making sure that um, the Office of Kindergarten Readiness inside the DOE is working with FSSA. Um, to, to make sure that our, our kiddos are ready for that next step and the next step after that. We'll also be, in, in Dr. Jenner's world, um, launching the Indiana GPS, or the Graduates Prepared to Succeed dashboard. This is something that's going to be very beneficial to um, community leaders, educators, everyone that's, that's uh, concerned about how a school um, and the students are performing as they are graduating. Um, and, and I'm looking very forward to this. has everything to do with, you know, civic and uh, digital literacy, communication skills, collaboration skills, um, your academic mastery, of course. But when, when companies are looking at school corporations and individual schools, this is all part of that new transition to that accountability. Uh, that we've been talking about and working on now for months and months and months. That will be uh, launched, Katie, that'll be this fall, 2022-2023 school year, uh, that will launch that Indiana GPS. We'll also be um, working on developing a teacher supply and demand marketplace. We want to make sure that we're getting those high demand, think STEM, um, think uh, special needs, we're make, we want to make sure we're filling those vacancies that are currently out there um, with teachers uh, who are looking for that employment. And so we'll be building this um, and are building this marketplace that connects those educators um, to those places of employment. And then lastly on this front, uh, same theme about connecting Hoosiers uh, to opportunities. 
we'll be working on uh, connecting unemployed Hoosiers with employers and jobs and the training necessary. So this is a very proactive approach to those. We've got a 3% unemployment rate here in the state of Indiana, lower than any state that we touch. That's 100,096 individuals. We've got 152,000 unfilled jobs posted on our state website. How do we match those? And so we'll proactively be reaching out to those 100,000 plus and getting them in touch if they're a veteran, getting them in touch with veteran services. If they're, if they're unemployed and they're a, uh, they don't have a high school diploma, we're, we're getting them attached to the services that they need. If they're a high school graduate with a diploma, getting them attached to those training services that they need and getting folks who are ready and able to work right now, um, sending them information on jobs that are available close to them right now and that they qualify, that they qualify for. On the third front, this has got everything to do with what we spent the, the better part of two years talking about and, and very intensely over the last six months of, as the um, Governor's Public Health Commission um, has, has been getting around on a statewide tour. But we'll be um, working on a number of items in addition to that as, as that information is gathered. Um, and um, we'll be ready for a 2023 budget session. But we're also going to be working with Dr. Barrett, Dr. Or Representative Brad Barrett, um, to make sure that we're strengthening the guidelines for childhood-led screening. Um, we're, we're in a bit of a um, hit and miss approach right now, uh, but we want to require those health providers to offer um, um, blood lead screening uh, for individuals who are 9 to 72 months old. So parents would be able to opt out, but we want to make sure uh, that they at least offer that and so that we have a real, a true picture of what the population that may have lead contamination. Um, we'll also be working with Representative Ed Clear to, um, on our continued efforts to reduce infant mortality um, by requiring a more comprehensive um, autopsy process for sudden unexplained infant death investigations. Um, this, this is um, gonna it's going to be good for everyone involved, obviously EMS and DCS and state police and the coroner uh, who is conducting this, but all of them coming together and then having the facts. And, and Dr. Box, you could elaborate on that later uh, if there's any questions on that. But this is, this is um, going to make a difference. And it may seem like a small item, but anytime you're talking about saving one life, um, huge, huge difference maker. And then something I want to kick it over to you now, something that we talk an awful lot about as well, and we hear about this when we're out on the road, something near and dear to your heart. Uh, we want to provide a comprehensive strategy to support Hoosiers who may be struggling with mental health issues. And so I thought maybe you would share a little bit about your work with stakeholders, your work with uh, this new approach and how we're going to start playing offense more so than ever. Well, thank you, Governor. Um, and you know, it really goes back to, I think it was the fall, November, maybe December of 2020, when we were sitting in your office mm. and talking about what we wanted to focus mm. on over the next four years, yeah. above and beyond our normal duties and responsibilities. Yeah. And I indicated for me, it was mental health and addiction, yeah. that the human cost of this pandemic is huge, and it's gonna exponentially grow for years to come. And not just the cost to our families, but the cost to our workforce, the cost to our budgets, whether we're in the public or the private sector. Uh, you mentioned we both travel the state a lot. And when I talk to school superintendents, teachers, Boy Scout, Girl Scout leaders, anyone that deals with young people, they will share with me that the amount of panic, anxiety, depression, suicide ideation, acting on suicide and self-harm is greater than they've ever seen with our young people. And that is the future of Indiana. Before COVID, one out of five Hoosiers struggled with mental illness or addiction. And there's not one of us that doesn't know someone that faces these challenges, maybe our own family members. And my family's no exception. My mother suffered from depression, my sister committed suicide, my brother's an alcoholic. Those Hoosiers who inherited genes that predispose them to these conditions deserve an opportunity 
to succeed in life. And Governor, Governor with your leadership and the General Assembly's support, uh, you all have appropriated an additional $100 million for mental health. Uh, that is going to go a long way towards enabling Hoosiers to succeed. But how can we engage the private sector more? How can we bring them alongside us in our efforts to tackle this pandemic that we're facing? Uh, and, and so we are launching the Lieutenant Governor's Roundtable on Mental Health uh, to be co-chaired by John Lechleiter, the former CEO and president of Eli Lilly and Company. Uh, and the, the launch of the founding members of this um, uh, roundtable that was launched in late 21 include the Ursay family and the Colts, the Simon family and the Pacers, uh, Eli Lilly and Company, a Division of Mental Health and Addiction, among others. And we need all voices to come to the table if we are going to tackle this massive challenge that we have before us. The goal of the roundtable is to convene inclusive and comprehensive group of leaders tackling mental health and addiction in the private and the public sector. Uh, and, you know, we also will look at spurring innovation by supporting our private sector partners. But here's what's really important. This roundtable will come alongside government and work with government to amplify what's working and to fill in the gaps on what is needed. And to learn more, you can go to our mentalhealthroundtable.org uh, to get information, to sign up for our newsletter, uh, to join us in our efforts. Uh, and the early response has been powerful. Groups from large to small businesses, nonprofits, faith-based groups, they have all raised their hand to help. And we encourage those who want to support us with their philanthropy or who just want to join in our efforts to, to sign up and to be a part of this so that together we can make the whole bigger than the sum of the parts. And it really reminds me of a quote that Helen Keller once said. She said that alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And state government, with the private sector working with us, can allow Hoosiers the opportunity, all Hoosiers the opportunity to be successful in life. Well, thank you for being such a good ambassador and for working with, I mentioned Dr. Rosiniak here and FSS and Jay and um, leading the charge. So I feel like um, this is one of those issues that when we compare notes, when we're, when we're connecting, um, something that frequently comes, creeps into the conversation about, did you, did you know of this around the state of Indiana? And the, and the real appetite for, as you mentioned, the private sector to come alongside and say, um, how do we partner with you to, to make a, a real difference? So thank you. Um, moving on to the, to the fourth pillar, community uh, development. Obviously, this has to do with the very foundation, the very platform of which uh, everything rests upon our infrastructure and in every which way that we connect with one another. Um, we are also going to, Homeland Security is here, Steve Cox, um, but we're also going to collaborate with local governments. We've already sent out surveys to local entities and we want to help them strengthen their cybersecurity um, efforts and, and uh, to make sure that they're truly protected. You're in receipt of some of the responses back already. We'll, we'll do the analysis, we'll share that with the local entities, uh, and then we'll have a, a local grant program that they can apply for to pardon or to make their, um, their uh, efforts more secure from a local perspective. We'll also, another thing that creeps into the conversations as we get out and about is there's a lot of excitement about the first round, I say first round of the READY program. Uh, the General Assembly appropriated $500 million and uh, the local uh, leaders saw that and said we can raise you another $500 million. So we're, we're, we're looking at this as the first phase of, of the READY program, but we'll be rolling those out. Local communities are right now in touch with the IEDC, going through their plans and their priorities uh, within, within their overall plan. And so we've got you know, a year to really be hitting the ground, running fast so that we can come back in 2023 and make the informed case 
that there is more to be done and we have the financial wherewithal here in the state of Indiana to do just that. We're also going to be continuing to implement and to build One Indiana through our roads and bridges program, through our trails. We're in round three of the trails. Our applications have already been sent back in. Uh, another, uh, a lot of excitement on the trail program and reaching that goal of every Hoosier living within five miles of trail access. Um, but also broadband, which falls under your portfolio and responsibility as well. You want to give us an update on the round that we find ourselves in now and, and speaking to the fact that we have um, incredible support here in the state, but we also got some federal um, support as well. Absolutely. And, and again, thank you for your leadership. You kind of got out on the broadband expansion and investment before other leaders in other states did, and Indiana now is the leader in that area. Um, because back in 2019, uh, with your leadership and the support of the General Assembly, $100 million was invested uh, to be able to expand broadband throughout Indiana. To date, we've awarded in that Next Level Connections program $80 million, which will connect 22,000 Hoosier families and businesses. Uh, and then COVID hit in 2020. And now with students e-learning and workers teleworking and healthcare being delivered telehealth, being connected is absolutely critical. Uh, and so the General Assembly passed legislation this past session. They also appropriated an additional $250 million to expand broadband. But the legislation they passed established the Indiana Connectivity Program, which is, to my knowledge, the only one of its kind in the country that actually empowers Hoosiers to contact us through a website or a toll-free number telling us, one, they don't have connection, or two, they don't have adequate speed. And then that is allowing us to be able to bundle those addresses and then go out to broadband providers to provide that service. We are actually in the process of kind of bundling those addresses. We'll be going out to broadband providers. We'll be looking at that first award sometime here in April. And then the other program that the General Assembly established was the subsidy program. Uh, that put a priority on health clinics, schools, and families with students. Uh, and that program will be rolled out by OCRA here um, this year. But to your point, being connected is really about economic opportunity and quality of life. And when you talked about all those remote workers, to get them to Indiana, we have to have that connection. Uh, and that, you know, that investment, uh, which is a record, that comes on top of the investment that the federal government is making. We know we're going to get a minimum of another $100 million uh, for infrastructure, broadband infrastructure. And, uh, you know, we won't rest. It'll continue to be a priority of your administration that we end up investing in broadband until every Hoosier is connected to that last mile. Love it. And expand that, expand our field. Um, critically important. We'll, we'll also, you, you talked about just the building and out of that whole network. We had a lot of building. It's going to be a busy spring. There's going to be a lot of dirt flying. A lot of orange cones. A lot of orange cones. Patience required. Um, that's progress. But, uh, but we've also got projects that are um, already appropriated and that work is underway, whether it's design or, or getting the construction managers, et cetera. But when you think about all over the state of Indiana, new State Park Lodge up in Potato Creek, new uh, correctional facility in Westville, um, but new deaf and blind schools, new archives building, and, and plus all those roads, plus all that broadband, plus all those trails, plus all the armories, the new armories, plus the uh, new rest stops, plus the new state police post and labs. And I-69? And that's a big one. Um, <laughs> and, and how you get to and from home. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that will be done by the by the end of this term, um, but, uh, and it's three years ahead of schedule and paid for, so um, thanks for that lead in. Uh, but there's, a, there's so many big projects that are, that are not just scheduled, but are being done right now all over the state of Indiana, and this is um, connecting us again with the, the world and the marketplace. The fifth and final, and then we'll open it up for, for any questions that you might have, the fifth and final pillar is providing good government service. 
Uh, this is what our agencies, I, I think, have done an incredible job um, since day one, but even over the course of the last two years under a lot of intense pressure and around the clock working. Um, but we, uh, it's hard for me to find an area where we skipped a beat, really. We just hunkered down and, and uh, did double time and we'll continue to make this a priority. And, and if, we, if we rank high or rank number one in some category, we're competing against ourselves now. And how do we continue to improve? Obviously, one area where we sought outside opinion on this um, um, was when we went to the third party and asked them to review our state law enforcement agencies. And specifically, I, I didn't mention the 70 million in upgrades at Alia. Uh, but we're also going to be broadening, expanding that board from 17 members to 21 members. Um, and so we'll have more input on a statewide basis uh, to make sure um, um, that we're um, operating uh, most efficiently and with equity always in mind. And then finally, Steve Cox is here. I don't see Joe Thacker. I don't see our state fire marshal. But um, we'll also, I'm pretty proud of this, I think one of four states, Steve, you mentioned, um, that has formed a partnership um, with IDEM and our Department of Homeland Security to collect and dispose of PFAS foam, which was outlawed a couple years ago. Um, but we will be paying for, the state of Indiana will be contracting with someone who will then collect and safely dispose of uh, this foam, and uh, that that's ongoing right now. The the uh, the bidding is out uh, right now, and and that is something that uh, that again only four states in the country are making this easier for locals and and, and with the emphasis on firefighter safety, um, and we're we're proud to to step up on that front. So um, obviously. I won't drone on more, but we've got a lot going on, a lot of implementation, a lot of connecting, a lot of constructing, a lot of growth and, and opportunity and progress. I keep reminding myself these are good problems to have, uh, growth problems and everything that comes from them. A lot of what we're doing is not just getting the work done right now, but we're preparing for, uh, which is now just 12, less than 12 months, depending on how you count it, away from a budget session. And we've, we're, we're going to be a year removed um, from a couple years where the federal government has pumped in billions and billions and billions of dollars into states. And we're going to be a couple, you know, a year away from, um, six months away from the findings for the Public Health uh, Commission and the capital projects. And we'll know a, a more up-to-date uh, rate of inflation and how that's affecting everything that we're building around the state of Indiana. Obviously, I mentioned ready. So we've got some pretty substantial um, price tags out there that we want to talk about in 2023 as well. And I think this year of work in the trenches going forward is going to pay dividends for the state of Indiana to make some, some good calls when we arrive uh, here next January. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We've also got folks from the agencies. If, if uh, they can be of help as well. I will open this up to questions. Remember, I will call on you, ask one question and a follow-up question, and we will also be taking some virtual questions. Our first one is Garrett Berquist from Wish TV. Please step up to the podium. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, following up on the legislature has been prioritizing this COVID-19 vaccination bill, I know you've spoken in the past that you're not necessarily a fan of it at this point are you a hard no on that or is it still up in the air what? well we'll 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 see where it ends up we'll be I'm, first and foremost i am looking forward to seeing my friends in the building tomorrow i'll let the record reflect that um we've been working f uh, for months now together and i'll work with the senate and the house as they um put forward different bills concerning this topic and I'll, again, just like a skipping record, I want to read every word of the bills that are put forward, amendments included. Um, but what I have asked for to end the emergency formally is the three items that I put forward, and I remain um, a hard yes on those three. And then a uh, follow-up question in the same vein. Uh, 
You mentioned the personal property tax elimination. Uh, your counterparts in the General Assembly are also looking at reducing the state's income tax uh, level. That would be potentially a, close to a $500 million hit to the state's coffers uh, beginning in fiscal 24. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I love that we're, I've said this before, I love that we're in this position to talk about cutting taxes. Um, we have a lot up in the air right now. I mentioned inflation, I mentioned the Public Health Commission, I mentioned uh, we've made a lot of progress on teacher pay. Um, I, wanna, I'm, I wanna see just how much exact progress we've made. This, this year is gonna buy us some time on that as well. Um, and all the collective bargaining that's been occurring. Um, I wanna focus on making sure that we stay number one in terms of manufacturing. That's why we started with new equipment. But look, we're, well, I'm, again, I wanna, I wanna work with the House and the Senate and they have different ideas themselves. And so, you know, we, 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 we don't, uh, um, show up and adjourn in one day. This is, this is a short session, but we've got a couple months ahead of us of, of real work. And so I wanna see where exactly their bills are, the fiscal hit that, that uh, it would take. And then I just ask everyone to keep in mind, I mentioned, and I wasn't exaggerating, um, uh, we've, we've had tens of billions of dollars flow into our state from the federal government over a two year period. And I want to make sure that we have an accurate picture, which is, by the way, found its way into our sales taxes. And so our revenue. And people have spent those three rounds of checks, and it goes on and on and on. And so I want to make sure we have an accurate picture so that we can cut taxes. That, that, that is the goal. I don't want to, um, but I want to pay our bills. And we've got some bills out there and some new ones, I think, coming. Um, and that's why our agenda is where it is right now. Now, we'll talk to folks, and if I can be persuaded, um, we're open-minded about this. Our next question is from online. Rob Burgess from the Wabash Plain Dealer. Good afternoon, Rob. Rob, you can talk now. We got a connectivity problem. Okay. All right, oh, we'll come hello. back. Can you hear me? Can oh. you hear me? Oh. Yes, hello? I can, Rob. Thank you. Great. Sorry. Yes, new headphones for Christmas. Um, <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy Monday. Good to be with you Happy again. Happy New Year. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Crouch, during last year's uh, Next Level press conference, we heard about the focus on housing insecurity. Um, can you tell me more about what progress you've made since then and what your goals for the coming year are? Sure. Thank you. Um, the housing agency that I oversee um, just in December released their housing inventory dashboard. Uh, over the past year, we have been conducting a county by county statewide inventory of our housing needs uh, by rental properties, single family, multifamily properties. Uh, and then that dashboard will allow you to overlay demographic information so that now County, local leaders, um, developers, builders, anyone can pinpoint exactly where the gaps and needs exist within a county. Uh, that in turn will help us uh, formulate kind of policy that will hopefully help us address that housing crisis. Because as the governor mentioned, as we continue to work, break records in creating jobs in Indiana, it's extremely important that we have places for people to live. Uh, and so that housing dashboard will actually start us on the road to being able to implement policy that will help us address that workforce and just general housing shortage. Our next question is from Sierra Putman from WTHR. Please step up to the podium. Good afternoon, Governor. Hello, Sierra. Um, so there are several bills focusing on schools this upcoming session. Um, just tell us what are, where do you stand with these issues? We've got some curriculum transparency and then also a bill that would require school board candidates to declare their party affiliation. I, I want to read the bills, honestly. We're, we're, we're not at, at we're T minus one day away. Um, 
the, the ink isn't even dry on some of these bills and these ideas that have been um, talked about. So I, I'm going to continue to be, the next three years will be just like the last five. I'm going to be thoughtful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to sit down and talk about people that have ideas that may be counter to my own. I'm okay with that. Uh, I, I want to give them an opportunity to, to share why they think their idea is better than mine. And if we can improve on our, our agenda, we will. That's a, a large part of, a part of this agenda that I just went over is, is getting things underway. And it's almost, um, the reason I'm so optimistic about it is it is all about collaboration when you talk about the IEDC proposals that I mentioned. And so whether it's got to do with schools and bills that people are band you know, tossing around and talking about, we'll talk to them uh, about them individually. But I wanna, I wanna make sure that I actually look at the bill, read the bill before I comment on the finality of my opinion. And we've had lots of reporting about the super majority in both the House and the Senate. Do you think that is going to lead to more conversations between your office and lawmakers? I've, I've had um, great conversations to date and I, I expect them to continue. Our next question from, is online from Alex Ebert Bloomberg. Good afternoon, Governor, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, can you talk a little bit about your weight here of tax policy? There are other states that are really hot to trot to cut taxes this year. It seems like you're a little bit more tentative and we'll be focusing on new incentives for businesses and remote workers. You know, why the delay? Why not go for the gusto right now? Well, I'm glad they're trying to catch up, Alex. Uh, we've been cutting taxes around the state of Indiana for the better part of almost two decades. Um, and we have found ourselves in a position where we rank number one in the Midwest and and number, you know, in the top five in the country for places to start businesses. Uh, we do every single year look at how we can tweak our tax code and make it even more attractive. And so when you rank so high in the Midwest and, and one of the top 10 states, according to the Tax Foundation, I'm, I'm proud of where we are, but yeah, we're gonna continue to try to, to make gain. We just, by the way, I don't know how many states are sending money back through an automatic taxpayer refund. We are. We just cut our corporate income tax rate again down to 4.9%. Talk to our neighboring states about that. Um, and so we pop off the map and we'll continue to make responsible tweaks, but we also like to live within our means around here and we like to address what our uh, other side of the ledger is, that being our expenses. We like to pay, when I ticked off all those new projects, we're paying cash for those projects. We are growing more than every state that we touch. We have a lower unemployment rate than every state we touch. Look at the census material. We grew by 20,000 between July 1 of 2020 and July 1 of 2021, more than every other state. In the 12 Midwestern states, we grew the most. So I'll elaborate more, Alex, during my State of State address next Tuesday, but we got a lot of good news and we'll continue to, to make responsible tax cuts and even increase our position of strength down the road. Our next question is from Kristen Eskow, Fox 59. Hello, Happy New Year. So just to follow up on that previous question about tax policy then, are, okay. you, are you willing to consider Absolutely. this year any tax cuts sure. or do you want the legislature to hold off to next year? I'll, I'll, my ears are wide open and I, and I gleefully look forward to hearing the discussions that are tossed back and forth from the House and the Senate. We've put forward ours, uh, our recommendations in our agenda, um, and we'll work with them, and I'm, my ears are wide open, but this is, we're gonna, we're gonna work to pass our agenda. And if it can be improved upon, we're, we're gonna be right there. And a couple weeks ago, we heard about the budget forecast for the state showing some pretty promising uh, projections in terms of revenue. So looking at that, and in addition to the revenue we saw uh, this past year, how do you want to see the state use that additional funding that's come in? Well, we allocated in a couple different places um, right now, one being the automatic taxpayer refund. Um, 
and and that's a that's a good thing. I'm glad it's there. I'm glad it was conceived of by um, one of our predecessors, two back. Um, I also want to be mindful of not just the bills that we have now, but the bills that may be coming in the future and the investments that I'll be making in 2023. We also know that um, just like every business out there, having talent is paramount to your success. I want to make sure that we're able to retain and recruit the best talent to state government. This is going to require an investment as well in 2023. So if anything, I'm trying to be disciplined about um, controlling my own appetite to open up the budget in a non-budget year. It can be done. I understand that. But I'm, I, what I want to do is be best informed about the decisions that we make and the bills that are going to be coming or the investments that we need to make. And I want to live within our means and I want to pay our bills with cash, unlike other states. The federal government has pumped in billions and billions of dollars. That needs to stop. Obviously, we can do this. The states can do this. Um, and, and we will continue to, if that's the case, separate ourselves from the rest of the class. Our next question is from Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Happy New Year, Governors. Happy um, New Year, Brandon. Uh, this gets to what you were just talking about in terms of opening up the budget this year, but more generally, should any responsible cut to the business personal property tax include some help for local governments who are going to miss out yes. on so much funding? Yes. And, and how do you do well, that? Well, that's, I mean, our proposal right now doesn't contemplate, yes, the, the short answer to your question is yes. And I would look for an offset. Ours is on new equipment, so it wouldn't be realized for years to come, and it would give us a time to actually understand what that price tag is. If you, if you just go whole hog and, and eliminate it completely across the board, then you're going to have some, uh, a significant price tag. And again, we do have the financial wherewithal and uh, dare I say creativity uh, to make sure that there are offsets for the locals. What, what this, what we seek to do, I think what we and uh, our friends in that, in the house, uh, Speaker Houston has um, elaborated on this idea. This, this needs to be a good thing for locals, not a, uh oh, and and so yes, uh, the short answer is we want to make sure that locals are whole, regardless of which plan is realized. And then um, the agenda item says strengthen early learning opportunities to best prepare students for kindergarten. You're talking about revamping the early learning advisory committee, creating a new office at the IDOE. Um, why not? But we, we we know that the problems are the biggest problems are availability and access. Um, and afford, excuse me, availability and affordability. So why not dip into the coffers at least a little bit to help out those parents to pay, you know, so that there are more places to go that are affordable for them? Well, for the early, Katie, feel free, but for the, um, for those early, or for those providers, there is funding there to build that capacity. Obviously, um, those providers, those employers need to make sure that it gets to the employees, uh, but that the funding is, is there to do what you seek to do in our agenda. And, and part, of, part of taking a look at ELAC and, mm -hmm. and really um, revising the membership of ELAC, it's also revising the function of ELAC. So, so this group will work to establish goals, establish standards, establish direct or, or I'm sorry, objectives, and then progress monitor. So again, you mentioned a, a couple other times already that you, you have to look at the data and then, and then move forward from there. So we'll be spending time as an ELAC to look at the data, look at the information, to then bring back any proposals we might have in the future. Our next question is from Nikki Kelly, Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. I just want to find out for sure. So you guys are sitting on a $4 billion surplus that's set to go up to $5 billion. Is there anything that you see that you could invest in right now in this coming session to spend money, whether it be opening up more pre-K dollars or, or something like that? Anything that you can spend that money on to help Hoosiers now? 
if there, if we could go back in time and know that the rosy picture that we thought we were looking at was even rosier than it was, we have the funding to do, to realize this agenda and, and the agenda that came out of, of the uh, budget session. We have the allocation that we need to get cracking, and we are. There, we will be right back here talking about a full budget um, in 12 months from today. And that will be here soon enough. But until then, we need to be better informed about the price tags of new items, new items that aren't budgeted for yet. So I'm good. I'm, I'm, I, I, I've said before, Lieutenant Governor said this, we are very proud of the budget that we have in front of us. Now it's about implementing and, and completing that to-do list. And it is a long, substantial list that will transform parts of our state. Our next question is from Whitney Downard, CNHI. Good afternoon, Good Governor and Lieutenant Governor. My question is, how do we make these workforce training opportunities more accessible to Hoosiers? You know, yeah. people can't use these training activities if they have childcare yep. that they're worried about or elder care or, yep. you know, various other life responsibilities. Yep. How do we make it so that way people can actually use this training and go to those higher paying jobs? That, that, that is the, the, um, the question that's going to make a difference, not in, not in an individual's life, but in the life of our state in the, over the next, I think, 10 years is how do we bring the resources that are there directly to the people. This is, this is what I talked about in terms of making sure we're connecting the unemployed, those 100,000 Hoosiers, with not just a job or a potential career, but with those, those um, training resources. And so through banner ads, through um, the, the connection with work ones, et cetera, we're, we're looking at resources that are out there. How do we get them to people right now? And that is a way, that is a very proactive way, actually, of not just waiting as a state or as an individual, waiting. This is proactively week after week after week after week for 26 weeks saying, here are opportunities for you to skill up, to reskill for the jobs that are there right now, for the jobs that are coming. We, we, we can connect you with how we can offset the cost of that training. We can connect you not with just the job or the career, but how you, how you skill up to be very attractive to multiple employers. And so in, in, in one word, maybe a part of it is technology is gonna enable us to connect those resources to people. And we will put it on their doorstep. We know that with 3%, again, lower than every state we touch, uh, uh, some of this has to do with aptitude. Some of it has to do with attitude in terms of filling the jobs that are available right now. Those, those 152,000 that I mentioned on our sta state website is a fraction of what's available. A lot of employers tell us they're not even um, posting half of the jobs that they would hire if they could find the half right now. And so the state of Indiana is growing and there is immense opportunity out there and you're scratching at exactly what we deal with every single day and that is how we can make sure people understand that in the state of Indiana, because we are paying uh, our way through um, uh, responsibly, that we can help you get the skills that you need to get in a job that you are actually passionate about, not just a job. And, and that's we'll, where we'll continue to lean into is proactively, consistently putting on someone's desktop or in their hand the resources available to skill up. Now, it takes two to tango, and we can do that for 26 straight weeks, uh, and we need some initiative on their end just as much as we need initiative on our own. And then follow up for Lieutenant Governor, you know, you made a very personal appeal for mental health and reducing that stigma and attracting more people to the profession, how do we get people to specifically join that profession, which is chronically underpaid and underappreciated? Oh, you're welcome. And Jay Chaudhry is here from Division of Mental Health and Addiction, and I believe if it's all right, 
May I defer to him because they actually are undertaking with the Division of Mental Health and Addiction some um, some efforts to actually attract people to the profession. All right, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. So um, we're undertaking a three-pronged approach: so recruitment, retention, and quality. So recruitment: how do we recruit more folks into the into the field uh, through? I think it starts as early as middle school, right? We go into middle schools and say, "This is." If you want to serve, you know this is this is this is a way to do it, and I think that we're lucky in that, you know, folks um, who are currently in middle school and high school, I think, have a much more open uh, appreciation about talking about mental health. So the recruitment's there, um, retention. So one of the things we talk about: how can we make uh, the job of a clinician not just 50% paperwork, 50% administrative burden? How do we actually let them get back to helping people? Um, and then quality, how do we invest in sort of the quality efforts? And so we're looking at kind of all three of those things um, through the Lieutenant Governor's leadership, um, especially as it relates to uh, the $100 million that the legislature appropriated. So happy to talk more about that at any point. Our next question is from Caitlin Lang, Indy Star. Good afternoon. Um, as you guys had just discussed, it seems like a big issue in Indiana is encouraging people to move here to actually encourage the workers here. I'm curious why um, push forward the business property tax? Um, how is that going to help solve this problem? And then also, how is this not opening the budget like a future income tax cut would be? Well, in terms of the new equipment, the 30% floor on eliminating that on new equipment, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see the hit immediately, um, or it would, it would take years um, to accumulate. That would give us time to figure out what the true hit would be. Um, in terms of your first question, to not um, be aggressive about maintaining our position as the number one manufacturing state in the country per capita um, means that we know that folks are looking at modernizing their operations right now. If, if they're not, they're slowly withering on the vine themselves. We want to make sure that's done here. And surrounded by states where we're not competitive on this front, one of the few areas, back to Alex, Alex's point, one of the very few areas where we're an outlier, we need to correct that. And we're in a position to where we can without a hit to the budget right now per our proposal. Again, I'm open-minded about the ultimate bill, um, but we need to do something on this front and it needs to be now. Our next question is from Emily Ketter, IBJ. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. So also talking about the business personal property tax. So lawmakers in the House have already said they are on board with reducing the business personal property tax, but the Senate has been more hesitant. Do you still think they need more convincing? <laughs> well, I'll try my damnedest. <laughs> Do you think they'd be more on board with your proposal for the tax on new equipment? We'll, we'll, we'll see. We, you know, we've, um, we've all been in communication. They've been very productive, very constructive conversations um, for, for weeks on end now. Tomorrow marks the first day. We'll all be in the same building at the same time. Hallelujah. And um, I, I think we will make progress as the coming weeks unfold on this front. Our next question is from Tom Davies, AP. With a high priority of a lot of uh, lawmakers is addressing the complaints that came up over how school boards handled mask mandates, teaching racism, and there's been a lot of talk of action on that. What do you think needs should be addressed in that issue and is injecting more partisanship in school board elections the proper step to take? Again, Tom, I'll look at the bills that come across my desk. There's a number of them. I've, I've got my agenda. That's what I think we need to focus on but I'm one of three entities. Um, and so I'll take a careful look at what, what their ideas are and I'll let you know as soon as I, as soon as I form an opinion on them. The, obviously, uh, as you discussed last week, 
we're still facing a lot of COVID-19 problems. There's nothing in your agenda you've talked about addressing the problems that the hospitals are having right now and others. Do you think you already have all the tools you need on that? And how does what we're going through now as a state justify with looking to end the public health emergency? Well, ending the public health emergency doesn't mean that COVID is gone. This is the ending the public health emergency. I identify the three formal technical issues that we can't afford to see let go. And if there's a different way to skin that cat, I'm, I'm open-minded about that. And one way is through the legislative process, but we'll continue on a day in day out basis on a weekly basis deal with COVID as long as it is with us. So, you know, that is, that is one thing. I mean, I can take a marker and write COVID on the top. Uh, if you want, but that's that's a, another item that we're doing on a day in day out basis. Um, that's also contemplated, by the way, in the Public Health Commission's work that they're doing. And so this will be um, not just thought through, but proposals that come out of that on operations, on structure, on delivery, in terms of what we've lived through over the next two years when we arrive at 2023. So it's not out of mind for by any stretch of imagination. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you.